Oh, it is three minutes after, so we can start with the continuation of the mini course by Julie about uh, rational curves and hypercalic manifolds. Uh, please give your full and undivided attention to Julie's presentation. All right, thank you, thank you for uh, being here for the second um, for the second lecture. So, um, what I'll do today is uh, start talking about um, rational curves on higher dimensional hypercal manifolds, and uh, let me remind you that uh, on K threes, uh, sorry, I want uh, this. So on K threes, we had. Uh, three main sources of rational curves. Um, we had either, um, so if uh, L was ample, and then we had um, linear uh, rational classes in the linear system, rational curves. Or we had uh, uh, isotropic classes that were NAF that define an elliptic vibration. And, uh, and so the, here are the uh, reducible fibers, uh, the irreducible components of the irreducible fibers uh, were minus two classes and in general minus two curves. Okay, and um, so there are going to be analogs of these three also on higher dimensional hypercalor manifolds. Uh, what I'll be focusing mostly today is uh, the analogs of these guys of the sort of, well, I guess also related to this, of course, but um, sort of here, I, I want to think of these as um, contractible curves. So uh, exceptional fibers, exceptional loci, of morphisms to a singular K3. Okay, and um, so, um, and so maybe next time I will, um, I will talk a little bit about the, these two parts uh, and it, it and ex explicitly giving sort of explicit constructions here. Um, and so maybe before I, I start telling you about um, the sort of analog of the minus two classes for higher dimensional hypercalor manifolds, uh, let me uh, say a couple things that, so the, the sort of main techniques to get uh, to get rational curves on higher dimensional hypercal manifolds are constructing explicitly um, explicit examples and uh, and we'll see that the Hilbert scheme of points on the K3 or moduli space of uh, objects on a K3 are going to be sort of good sources of, of a construction of examples. And then the other thing is deforming rational curves. And so I'll end the, the lecture today uh, with a little um, section on deformation of rational curves on uh, compact hypercalor manifold, which um, Turn out to be sort of satisfying in some sense. It's uh, there's a lot one can say about them. So it's uh, I'll give a little sort of general uh, general um, uh, theory about it. Which of course, and depending on the three cases here, uh, sort of will, they will behave a little differently, but they all have in common just the fact that rational curves and hypercal manifolds deform well. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, maybe um, let me say that um, sort of the analogs of these three things, maybe
Maybe I'll give them sort of a name, one, two, and three. Um, uh, so the analog of one will be looking for uni-ruled divisors in uh, positive linear systems, whatever that means. And um, the analog of two will be um, looking at singular fibers. of Lagrangian vibration. And the uh, sort of that group scheme action that I mentioned a couple of times last time is gonna be relevant for this part. And, um, and the third part, uh, the analog will look at uh, exceptional loci locus of uh, the rational maps. of uh, birational maps, morphisms. From a Brickeller to a singular guy. Okay, which is what we'll, we'll do today mostly. And, um, okay, so before um, we start with uh, number three, let me remind you that uh, if, uh, if C is an irreducible minus two class on a K3S, um, there's a so-called a Tia flop where uh, we deform the K3 uh, in a direction where the class of the curve does not stay algebraic. And we can flop the curve in the total space, which is a threefold. And we get a family of K3s whose fibers are just uh, the same as the fibers of the previous family. But globally, the fibers, uh, the, the two families are not isomorphic. And in fact, so the, the two fibers uh, are just the same. But when you look at the identification of the cohomology of the two uh, fibers, so of the two central fibers obtained by uh, doing parallel transport away from, from the origin, um, the identification is not the identity, but is a reflection in the minus two class C. Okay, and uh, this is a, this sort of example is a source of the non-separatedness issue of the moduli space non-separatedness of the moduli space of K3s, of K3s. And uh, we're gonna see this phenomenon happening also in higher dimensional hypercalers, but uh, there is sort of extra degree of, of, of complicatedness because um, in this example, the, the two central fibers are isomorphic, whereas for hypercalor manifolds, the two central fibers will not necessarily be isomorphic, but just birational. Okay, so that's sort of a rough idea of what's uh, coming next. Okay, so let me start now. The, this is just a kind of general intro. Um, let me start in the first topic of today's lecture, which is prime exceptional divisors. Okay, so definition. So X will always be a compact hypercalar, not irreducible in the sense of last time of dimension, say to N. Um, so E uh, reduced and irreducible, a prime divisor in X is called prime exceptional divisor 
if uh, the Bovil Bogomolo form of E is less than zero. Okay, so let me remind you that uh, the H2 of XZ uh, has this uh, quadratic form, which I'll denote by either Q or just uh, E dot E sometimes. Um, uh, I won't be very consistent with, with the notation. Uh, Bovil Bogomolo form. And uh, so the, the, the useful thing before we go forward is to notice that uh, there's induced uh, rational pairing rational quadratic form on the space of curves. I'll tell you in a second what it is. And so if um, the sort of um, first way to study um, rational curve and hypercalar manifolds is study divisors that are swept out by rational curves as these guys will turn out to be, these prime exceptional divisors. Um, we want to study at the same time curves and divisors and uh, the sort of this quadratic form is one of the main tools that, that we have to, to do so. And so how do you put the rational pairing on H2Z? Well, um, of course, any lattice is embedded uh, into its dual by just sending a class X to Q of X point. And this can be identified with H2 of X Z. Okay, and so this uh, gives the rational pairing. on H2 of oh, XZ. And maybe let me remind you, give you the example. So if, um, if say E is the divisor of the Hilbert Chow uh, morphism, um, exceptional locus of the Hilbert Chow morphism, um, we saw last time that uh, this is just uh, H2 of the K3 plus uh, Z delta, where um, E is two delta and uh, delta square is minus two and minus one. And uh, if we let R be the class of the ruling, we know that the exceptional divisor is, is ruled by, because it's generically a P1 bundle over the smooth part of the singular locus then uh, we know that uh, the ruling is going to be a multiple just because it's orthogonal of the part that comes from downstairs from, from the symmetric product of the K3. So we know that there exists a constant such that uh, R is a multiple of this class delta. We wanna compute what this multiple is in order to compute what the pairing, um, the Bogomol of square of this curve R is. And so since, of course, uh, the intersection of E with uh, R is just minus two, it's a canonical class of uh, P1, then um, we get that the, the multiple is the, this rational multiple here, one over two n minus two. And so this gives uh, the um, Q of R. Uh, one minus one over to one minus two. Okay, so this is just uh, an example, but of course the, the whole thing of the study of exceptional divisor will, will play, will, will be played with this um, sort of uh, exceptional divisor. It turns out it will be a uni ruled, the class of the ruling and uh, sort of, um, um, and, and sort of the, the numerics of these, um, of the of the exceptional divisor and of the ruling itself, and um, okay, so uh, let me then start telling you a little bit about the geometry of these uh, prime exceptional divisors. So the first uh, important remark is uh, theorem by Duell, building on works of Buxom, 
which says the following. So um, X and E is above. Then um, uh, up to passing to a birational model of X. So now here I mean that uh, X prime is a hyperkeller birational model. Um, so after performing a sequence of flops, so and uh, the birational map is a sequence of flops. then I can contract the exceptional divisors. So if I have a prime divisor with negative Bogomolov square up to passing to a different birational model, I can contract it. So what this means, so let E, B, e prime be the um, proper transform of um, divisor E in X prime, and so maybe here, before I go forward, let me remark that uh, uh, birational hypercalor manifolds are isomorphic in co-dimension two. So in particular, their uh, second cohomology groups can be isomor uh, identified and, uh, and so there's also no ambiguity in saying what divisor, uh, of course, the proper transform is well defined, but it's uh, sort of particularly well behaved. And so the statement of, uh, of Duell and Buxom is that up to uh, passing, performing this finite sequence of flops, and I can, I can contract this, this divisor. So um, there exists a proper birational morph, morphism or projective, if you want. Uh, so proper birational morphism, contracting E. So whose exceptional locus is E. Um, and uh, here, so this is a contraction where uh, we have the following facts. So um, Y is a singular symplectic manifold. It's not manifold, sorry, variety, uh, singular symplectin. I'll give you the definition of, of a singular symplectic variety in a second. And uh, uh, most importantly, the general fiber of this map is either um, a P1, in which case Y has an A1 singularity generically along Z, or it's a union of two P1s meeting transversely, in which case Y has an A2 singularity along um, the smooth locus of Z, the singular locus. Okay, and, um, and so in particular, um, e, e prime is uniruled, or E is uniruled. So it's covered by the formations of these rational curves that uh, constitute the fibers of the contraction. Um, okay, and so there are a couple of uh, remarks to make. Um, first of all, I should uh, tell you what uh, the definition of a singular symplectic variety is. Uh, so Y needs to be normal. Um, and uh, maybe quasi projective if you want, but, um, and you want that the regular locus, the smooth locus of Y has a holomorphic two form, holomorphic symplectic, uh, has a holomorphic symplectic form. And uh, maybe let me call it um, sigma. And it has a property that for any resolutions of the singularities of Y, um, the pullback of this form on smooth locus extends to a regular uh, holomorphic form on all of. Okay, so it doesn't acquire poles, and uh, and so the this the base of that contraction is uh, symplectic. Uh, so 
why is called uh, symplectic variety. If uh, the smooth locus has a holomorphic uh, form and uh, holomorphic symplectic form and it has its properties. And there's a nice characterization of this in terms of singularities. Uh, they, um, Y has what are called rational Bornstein singularities and uh, in co-dimension two, it's uh, the singularities are kind of nicely, nice and well behaved. And then the other thing that we know is um, by work of Kaladin is that uh, Y is stratified. There's a stratification um, in uh, locally closed symplectic varieties. So we start with a smooth locus of Y and which is the complement of the singular locus of Y and, and, and so the, the smooth locus of the singular locus is going to be a symplectic, uh, a smooth symplectic variety and the singular locus or maybe it's normalization will be a symplectic variety in the sense and so on. You have this uh, sort of stratification. I'm not going to use anything about this but it's just to, to, to say that in particular, uh, for example, you have a holomorphic symplectic form on, on Z, on the, the sort of image of that, of that uh, contraction. And uh, we're going to see this fact, this is a more general fact about uh, um, spaces of, of, in some sense, of rational curves on, on hyperfellow manifolds. So we'll say that. We'll see that later again at the end of this class. Okay, and uh, the other uh, thing to notice uh, relate, in relation to the fact that uh, this thing is unruled is that the, these, um, these, five, these, these curves that, that sweep out, these rational curves that sweep out this divisors are in fact the algebraic leaves of a natural foliation that is on this divisor. In fact, if uh, so, if we let uh, sigma x prime be the symplectic form on uh, x prime, which is this birational model where x was contracted, then when you restrict it to to this divisor on the smooth locus, um, of course the rank drops. So the rank of this form this has has rank. Um, of course, that's an odd dimensional. Uh, Right, E is odd dimensional, and so it has rank equal to um, dimension. Generically, we'll have rank of uh, equal to dimension of E minus one. So there's a kernel, and this kernel defines a foliation. So, so this defines a foliation on the smooth locus of the divisor. Okay, and, uh, and in fact, this foliation has algebraic leaves which are none other but uh, the curves in the ruling, the rational curves. Okay, and this too will be sort of something that will we'll, we'll kind of generalize uh, when we look at uh, spaces uh, uh, or sub varieties of hypercalor manifolds that are swept out by rational curves. There's going to be this kind of sort of kind of vibration structure where uh, we have um, some kind of vibration like like this uh, contraction here. It's not going to be exactly like that, but contraction where we have the fibers will be covered by rational curves and the base will have a holomorphic two form. Okay. So, um, of course, a natural question is to ask now, what are the possible, uh, sort of for K3s, we know that uh, the possible squares of the prime exceptional divisor is just minus two. And so the natural question is what are the possible squares 
of prime exceptional dividers. And so uh, where to look for them in particular. And, uh, and so Markman has done a, um, a lot of work on this. So let me remind you what, what he shows. And in particular, we'll see that um, the, the possible squares of prime exceptional divisors are constrained by the fact that they act on cohomology by a reflection, just in, in the way that uh, minus two classes act on cohomology of a K3 when you have that IT, ITF law. Okay, so this is sort of the, the same exact thing where sort of the most, um, sort of, there's a natural generalization of that to uh, these prime exceptional divisors. Um, and uh, maybe, um, I was wanted, I wanted to give you a few examples. Um, and maybe I will give them to you uh, after I, um, I write, write down Markman's results. Okay. Okay, so uh, first, uh, let me introduce this class, uh, eCheck, and uh, which is by definition minus two Q of E dot uh, over Q of E, e which a priori is just a, a class in H lower two of X Q. Okay, so this is certainly something that makes sense. Um, and so the first result uh, of, of Markman is that this class is the class um, of a general fiber of the contraction. Um, so, okay, let me uh, drop the primes and assume that I have this hypercalar manifold that uh, where I'm contracting Z without having to pass through a rational model. I can, I can always, uh, you know, by changing from X to X prime, I can always assume that to the contraction E to, to Z. Okay, in particular, because it's a class of a curve, it's integral. Okay, and so this already uh, is going to limit vastly what the possible squares of prime exceptional divisors are, depending on sort of the geometry of the lattice of the H2 of the um, hypercal manifold. Okay, and, uh, and so the second, uh, the second result comes from um, uh, work of Namikawa, I mean, it's like how it uh, uses, it's, a, it's by Markman, but it uses uh, work of Namikawa. And so let me first uh, remind you what uh, Namikawa's results imply. So, um, so first of all, um, we know that uh, the, in, in the setting, Y uh, has a smooth deformation space. So, um, so maybe let me write it this way. So the deformation space of Y is smooth, even if it's a singular um, variety, but it's, uh, it's smooth of dimension equal to uh, dimension of the deformation space of X. And also there's this very nice relation between the deformation space of uh, X and the deformation space of, uh, of Y. So here Y is this, uh, X is this inflected resolution of, of Y. And so the, the statement is that uh, there exists a, a map uh, from the deformation space of the smooth thing to the deformation space of the singular guy. And here, because it's this thing, they're smooth of the same dimension. 
and this map is surjective with finite fibers. And this comes only from the fact that Y has rational singularities. And then there's this um, even um, nicer thing, which if you look at the, the universal families of the deformation spaces, uh, the, this finite map is compatible with a map between the exceptional, with, in between the, um, the universal families. And in fact, uh, sort of the, this, this induces an isomorphism between a general fiber, a general smoothing, a general YT, and a general XT. So the, the XTs are all smooth because they're small deformation of the smooth guy. And so what this is saying is that in particular, uh, there are smoothings out of the singular guy, which are also deformations of the symplectic resolution. Uh, question. Yeah. In this uh, kind of conical case, that map is a uh, quotient by a group, but in general, it's yes, not a quotient. So in fact, uh, I was going to say this, it, it, this is coming next, exactly. And so this is where Markman, uh, I don't know. Uh, so um, this is a, 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 a branch gala cover. Is this what you were uh, asking? And, uh, and so where, so for example, in the case, uh, in the case where I have this uh, X and Y is a uh, contraction of a prime exceptional divisor, uh, the, the Galois group is Z mod two, and it's generated by the reflection in E, where uh, again, this reflection here is just uh, X goes to X minus two uh, Q of E, X Q of E, E, E. Okay, so this is what, I was saying earlier where um, this is kind of the, the analog of the reflection in the minus two classes. Okay. Um, okay, so that was uh, uh, number two. And um, then you have things like uh, at most, so E and this class E prime are either both primitive classes in the lattice or at most one is divisible by two. And the last part, uh, which we can prove at the end after I, I talk about deformation of rational curves, um, the uh, E deforms where its class stays algebraic. It's a cohomology class states of type one one. Okay. And uh, okay, so these are uh, a bunch of general facts and uh, they sort of, you know, bring um, sort of uh, Markman to give numerical characterizations So when I say numerical, I mean in terms of the Bilbao-Bogomolo form and the divisibility of the class, where uh, let me remind you that the divisibility is the um, positive generator of the ideal Q of E H2 of XZ. Okay, so of course for a unimodal ladder, lattice, that's, that's just one. So for K3 surfaces, we don't have that. But uh, for um, higher dimensional hyperkellers, the lattice is not unimodular. And so you have that uh, non-trivial divisibility. Um, so you get numerical characterization of uh, prime exceptional divisors and their limits. Okay, and uh, and in particular for uh, so for example, if uh, X is of K three N type, 
uh, then um, you either have Q of E equals to minus two or uh, Q of E is equal to um, two minus two N. And in this case, the um, N minus one divides the divisibility. Okay, so if you are interested in um, a prime exceptional divisor on um, K3M a manifolds in K3M type, then you have to look among, among these guys. And in fact, there is sort of uh, even more sort of a nicer or um, sort of, I mean, there's more, there's more precise characterization than that. And uh, I, I don't want to get into that, but if you're interested in, then you should look at Markman's paper called Prime Exceptional Divisors. Uh, okay, and so let's uh, let's give examples of of these guys. We, you know, if this is A, this is B. We know that uh, B is uh, the Hilbert Chow divisor. We just saw that. And uh, let me give you an example of A. So, and this comes from uh, Bayer McCree. Uh, so, if um, so uh, example of this type are, uh, let me call them divisorial contractions. Associated with spherical objects. And more precisely, uh, if I have a primitive Mukai vector, algebraic homology of S, and uh, I look at uh, moduli space of uh, stable sheaves with uh, friction stable objects with Mukai vector uh, V. And suppose I have a class um, uh, delta with delta square equals to minus two. So this corresponds to a spherical object. Say, uh, I don't know, A, with uh, Mukai vector of A equals to delta. Spherical object means that it's a uh, self x uh, uh, algebra is just like the cohomology of the sphere. And, uh, and so then um, I have sort of a uh, divisor in, in, I'm being a little imprecise, but roughly speaking, maybe a few. So there, what I'm saying is they're um, up to changing the stability condition uh, there's a divisor D uh, whose class, and so here I want, sorry, delta to be perpendicular to B. Okay. Uh, there's a divisor class here, which consists of all objects uh, such that the Homs from A into E are non-zero, or the Homs from E into A are non-zero. And this is a, it turns out it's a divisor and the class of, of D in uh, the H2 of MVZ, which is just V perp, just corresponds to the class delta, which is in V perp because, because of this. Okay, so maybe let me give you a sort of neat example of this. Um, so let uh, V be, um, okay. So uh, S H polarized K3 of genus G. We go back to Lagrangian vibrations. So we choose a Mukai vector of this form, uh, meaning that uh, the Lagrangian vibration corresponds to um, degree G minus one line bundles or um, sheaves on, on the curves. So relative Jacobian. Uh, of degree G minus one. And uh, inside the degree G minus one Jacobian, relative Jacobian, there is of course the closure of the theta divisor. Of course there is uh, in, uh, in the smooth fibers, there's a naturally defined theta divisor and uh, take the closure of that. Um, it works in family because it's naturally divide, uh, defined. And, uh, and the claim that this corresponds to exactly the spherical class one zero one, which in fact is the Mulcai vector of the structure sheaf. 
right? And in fact, the theta divisor is a set of, of line bundles or torsion uh, pure dimension one sheaves L uh, such that Homs from O that have sections is not equal to zero. And sort of here, it's a, you see very nicely how uh, theta is uniruled because um, we have a birational map um, um, from the relative symmetric product of the family of curves, or maybe I should say relative Hilbert scheme um, to theta. And, uh, and this is a P1 bundle over the Hilbert scheme of G minus one points on the K3. And so this is a P1 bundle. What is the P1 bundle? If I have a, a, a point here of length Z, that's exactly the P1, the pencil of curves through those G minus one curves. And so we have this divisor here in this Lagrangian vibration, which is relatively ample, but in fact, it's an exceptional divisor. And it's uniruled, and we have all these P1s here that are sent under this map to, to pencils on the base. Okay, so um, sort of that was kind of um, an example which I particularly like, and maybe I should say there's a similar picture for O'Grady 10. Uh, for a theta the theta divisor in the intermediate Jacobian vibration. And, uh, and for example, here in, in this example, you, you know, using the bio McCree machinery, you know exactly what are the flops that you need to do in order to contract the the proper transform of theta. And for example, the first plot that you have to do is always to, um, actually, sorry, in this example, I think that, uh, yes, uh, sorry. Uh, I think in this example, okay, maybe you should, uh, okay. in this example, the you can contract it without passing to a barational model. Okay. Uh, but in general, um, sort of when you do have a situation where you have a, um, a spherical object, the bio McCree tell, machinery tells you exactly what are the flops that you need to do in order to contract. Okay, and um, and so uh, uh, you can put the pencils on the base back. There was nothing wrong with the pencils on the base. Oh, that's true. <laughs> the uh, yeah, which is, is something that I, I I think is kind of nice that um, you have all these rulings that are mapped to, to pencils. And um, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, there are other ways of using the bio McCree stuff to um, get to the sort of contractions. I don't think I want to get into the details, but I'll just say you have the divisors called uh, Hilbert Chow, and uh, they correspond to not spherical objects, but to isotropic classes. Uh, that intersect V and 1, and then you have the uh, Ulenbeck uh, morphism, which is, again, isotropic class with W times E equals to 2. And uh, I won't say uh, more about this, but uh, the important thing is that uh, once you have a sort of good descriptions of how things work in these Moduli space, you can use deformation theory to move around, move things around, and, and sort of get descriptions of divisorial contraction in the whole moduli space of uh, hypercalor manifolds of K3N type. Um, and so, I don't know, if, probably I won't uh, do this this time, but uh, um, there's a paper of Bayer, Hassett, and Chinkel where they sort of get the results of Bayer-McCree describing the 
birational geometry of all these modulite space and, and deform the contraction, so to say, to get results about um, arbitrary hypercal manifolds in that deformation class. So maybe, maybe I'll say something about that next time. Um, okay, so, um, and, and so why, why do, you know, people care about these divisors, other than, of course, giving you a lot of rational curves, it's because these uh, prime exceptional divisors govern the birational geometry. Of, um, of hypercal manifolds. And uh, how so in the following way, um, maybe let me remind you for K3 what the situation is. The nephton of a K3 is the classes uh, in the positive cone. So I, I pick the component that uh, contains an ample class and I'll let that be the positive cone that intersect uh, positively for all uh, minus two curves, or non-negatively for all minus two curves. Okay, and so we have sort of the analog picture for hypercal manifold, which is the following. Um, let me first, uh, so for hypercalers, what, what's the situation? Let me first introduce the movable cone of X, which uh, you can uh, sort of define it as the closure of the union of the uh, f upper star of the nef cone of x prime as you vary the birational models of x prime. And so here, here birational models, I mean hypercalar birational models, of course. And here you want to close it. And um, so by results of uh, Heubrecht's Uh, Buxam and Markman, this uh, movable cone is um, the set of all classes in the positive cone of X. Again, I choose the component that is um, that contains an ample class that intersect uh, positively such that, sorry, what's this? such that Q of X uh, paired with E is non-negative for all E prime exceptional divisor. Okay, so it's really the um, generalization of, of the K3 um, minus two classes. So here you have the, these classes, uh, the, these are the C perps are the walls of the nef cone of S. And here you have these E perps that are walls of the movable cone. Of course, for K3s, you don't have uh, two birational K3s, two smooth birational K3s are isomorphic. And so um, you only have these minus two classes that bound the nef cone. But here, in fact, you, you not only have the things in the boundary of the movable cone, which are the prime exceptional divisors or the, the orthogonal to the prime exceptional divisors, but also you have the interior walls that, that separate different birational models. And so you also have the, um, I mean, the birational geometry of, of X is, is governed by these uh, prime exceptional divisors. And there's, then we have these kind of interior walls. And um, um, and this is sort of where um, this paper of Hassett, uh, Bayer, Hassett, and Tinkle comes in, which I'm going to say something maybe um, for K3 and type next time. Uh, and here I should also mention the words MBM classes uh, by Amarik and Brubitsky. 
And roughly speaking, it corresponds, these corresponds to uh, rational classes that um, correspond to extreme arrays uh, in um, corresponding to birational maps of, of this form. So maybe I'm going to say something, uh, something later. Um, and um, okay, so before um, talking about um, Uh, let me uh, let me see. Um, have the deformation space. Maybe I'll just do that. I here I was thinking now of of giving you examples of of these birational um, uh, these flops using the biomacree thing, but I think it makes more sense to do it next time when I tell you what. Uh, uh, this decomposition is for moduli spaces of um, objects on a K3 using uh, Bayer-McCree stuff and bridge instability, and then tell you how Bayer, Hassett, and Schinkel deform the results here to obtain um, a, um, a, a characterization of the walls that are separate nap cones of different birational models. Okay, so I'll probably do that next time. Meaning that here, of course, you you want to you want to have replace the minus two classes, and you would like to have characterization of the numerical what the numerics of the classes whose walls whose orthogonals give the walls of these cones. And, uh, and so Bayer McCree do it for these modulite spaces and then uh, Bayer ha um, Hassett and Schinkel deform the results for um, all hypercalories in that, in that deformation class. So, and, and to do that, they, they use deformation of, of rational curves. And so uh, this is what I was gonna do next. Uh, Um, okay, so I will, um, while, I, uh, while I, I, I talk about this, I won't be very precise with the attribution. I'll just name at the beginning uh, a bunch of names and maybe say who was doing what, but it looks like when you read the literature, it's uh, a lot of things that are being discovered and rediscovered. And, and so then if you look back at these old papers, you see that they already knew what people were proving now. But um, so it looks like some things have many, many authors, but um, tracing back, it looks like uh, these people are, um, are really sort of behind these things. Uh, Ran, Reserva, um, and um, actually, right, was on. And then maybe I'll also add uh, several other names, Markman, uh, Amerik Rybitsky, Hassett and Chinkle and um, some, a lot of other people. Okay, so uh, I will uh, aim to proving the following proposition. Let uh, C in X, X a hypercalar dimension to N, be a rational curve. By this I mean, uh, the image of a generically injective morphism map morphism from P1 into X. Okay, and so the statement is the following. Number one, um, C deforms in a family of dimension greater or equal to 2n minus 2. 
second, um, if uh, the curved class is into composable, let's see, is into composable. Like, uh, for example, it's an extreme array or it's of minimal degree. So here, what I mean is that I can't deform, I can't deform C so that it breaks. This is what it means. Then um, C deforms in um, X in a family. So here it deforms in X, of course, in a family of dimension exactly to N minus two. Uh, third, is if C deforms in X in a family of dimension exactly two N minus two, then C deforms over the locus in uh, deformations of X where the class stays of type, where the class of C days of type. What is it? N minus one, N minus one. Okay, where the class stays algebraic, which is a smooth uh, hypersurface inside the formation of X. I'll say that in a second. Uh, or maybe actually I can say it now. Let me uh, just remind you that I have a period map from the deformation space into uh, into uh, the period domain, which is inside uh, the projectivization of a complex cohomology. And here, the period domain is an open subset in the quadric uh, x squared equals to zero. Here, the square is the boville bogomolov I'm not writing Q, but, and I, I have a sort of analytic open subset here. Okay, and the map uh, to a deformation of, um, of the central fiber associated its uh, symplectic form or maybe the ray spanned by the symplectic form, okay? And uh, so this is a period map, it's a local isomorphism. And uh, the locus where a class stays algebraic is, uh, so the locus where alpha stays of type one one is of course uh, where it's orthogonal to the symplectic form. And so it's the hyperplane alpha perp inside this, this thing. And so you, it's, a, it's a hypersurface, smooth hypersurface. And of course, because the H lower two and H upper two are, are basically the same, when you pass the Q coefficients, this is the, where C stays of type one, uh, uh, N minus one, N minus one is, is sort of described similarly. Okay, and, uh, and so then the last uh, statement here uh, about deformation of rational curves is the following. Let uh, Z be an irreducible component of the locus swept out by C. Then uh, Z is, is called uh, algebraically co-isotropic. This is a term, uh, a definition due to Voisin. Algebraically co-isotropic. Um, so what does this mean? It means that uh, Z is isotropic, co-isotropic. So it's a, the tangent space in the smooth um, locus is a co-isotropic subspace of the tangent space of the symplectic map. Co-isotropic. And then there exists a, a, a rational map uh, from Z to B, where say uh, Z has co-dimension K, then the dimension of B is equal to 2n minus 2k. And uh, so the general fiber of, um, of this map has dimension k. And um, if you look at the symplectic form on X and you restrict it to Z, 
then it's a pullback of a holomorphic two form. on B, okay? And uh, which is uh, uh, gonna be generically non-degenerate. Okay, so this is what I was referring to earlier when I, when I was uh, looking at the uh, divisorial contraction and looking at what happened to the divisor. And this was a generically a P1 bundle. And, uh, and I said that this is the, the singular locus of the that um, the Birash that, that that y and it has a holomorphic two form on the spoke locus and uh, and so this is precisely the fact that the genetic fiber sorry the p1 or uh, two two p1s meeting in in one point if the the there are those two options um, but in any case there the all the all holomorphic forms on E because of the shape of the fibers, they have to come from downstairs. And in particular, when you restrict the form uh, from X to E, then um, it, it's, uh, it has to come from the form on Z. Okay? So um, I will spend the rest of the talk um, uh, proving these facts or giving a sketch, maybe it's more appropriate to say. And uh, let me first uh, give you though an example, uh, which is due to Wazan. Um, so if I, uh, which where here you, um, um, if uh, where we, this, where which shows that this, this proposition is sharp in the sense that uh, I give you an example of a rational curve in a hypercalum manifold that deforms in codimension two and not in codimension one, but whose class is not minimal. So here, um, maybe I should say, uh, it deforms over the locus where it stays of type of algebraic type. And so this is a codimension, well, I said that, but so this is codimension one. Okay, and so the example is the following. Um, let uh, S be uh, two to one cover of P1 cross P1 and K3 ramified appropriately. And uh, so if I look at the Hilbert scheme of two points on S, I can look at, uh, there's a copy of P1 cross P1 um, sitting naturally there. And I take uh, for C a conic, And the class is really not uh, uh, indecomposable in the sense that I'm describing above because you can break a conic. And, uh, and you can check that in fact, this deforms only where the Hilbert scheme stays the Hilbert scheme of the K3 of this type. And so this is in co-dimension two. Okay, so um, you really need the, the condition uh, some condition on, on, on the curves to deform in, in co-dimension one. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's start with the proof, uh, and uh, I will prove uh, one and three, and then two and four together. Okay. So one and, and three are. I think uh, basically due to Ran. And maybe there's an issue if uh, I think maybe Ran was only in the projective case and then maybe Reserva did it for non-projective, but essentially the, the idea of the proof is, is sort of the same. And so, um, okay, you just compute the, if you look at the dimension, say of the space of morphisms, from P1 to X and the given point F corresponding to that curve, then we know that this is um, greater or equal to the dimension of X, this is the general formula, plus uh, KX dot C, and this is zero, so this is equal to 2N. And so if, uh, if you take away the automorphism of, P, uh, of P1, you take away three, so you get that, uh, so I don't know what, uh, if you want to call it the space of the dimension of the rational curves 
in X, so class uh, may be, may be beta, where beta is a class of C, um, and you look at the dimension at C, then this is dimension greater or equal to 2n minus 3. Maybe instead of, maybe I should write, instead of writing uh, dimension of the space of rational curves, I should write um, the moduli stack of um, of uh, genus one, genus zero maps. Okay, so my claim in, in the theorem was, was one dimension better. And uh, how do you get that? Well, um, the, um, the, the observation is that you can uh, deform, uh, you can deform X in such a way that uh, C is not algebraic anymore and say, um, here I have, uh, and so the, and, and so if I, if I deform in, so here if I the, have the deformation space of, of X and here's the locus where C stays algebraic, of course I can take the little curve, which is transverse and, and then the, the space of, 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 um, of morphisms in, um, from P1 and X uh, is the same as the, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, um, how do I wanna say? Um, okay, let me say it this way. Then this is the same as as the space when I when I add one dimension, and so uh, I get that instead of having dimension of x, I have dimension of x plus one, and so uh, I get that this uh, this the dimension at uh, f of this m uh, zero x beta is greater or equal to two m minus two because I can add plus one here. Okay, and um, so this is just uh, using the fact that uh, I can deform in this transverse direction. Okay, and um, and so then I'll I'll prove three here. That, that's also this uh, reduced virtual class computation, right? I mean, if you have a. Oh, sorry. That's also this reduced virtual class computation because you you look at the abstractions and then there is a. A, co a trivial quotient to that abstraction. Yeah, that's that's the same computation. People may be more familiar with this reduced reduced okay. virtual class computation because that this this two n minus three that's the actual virtual dimension, but two n right. minus two that's the reduced. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I guess I'm I'm less familiar with that, but uh... yeah. But a lot of people in this seminar yeah, do kind yeah, of reduced yeah. classes. So, uh, I I guess yeah, yeah sure. Okay, um, so, so now uh, I want to prove three, which was I want to show that if the dimension is equal to 2n minus 2, then it deforms um, where the class stays algebraic. And, um, and so again, we say, uh, where's, what's my notation? Um, well, say maybe B is the locus inside the deformations of X, where the class stays algebraic, and uh, and then the same computation we had earlier uh, said that the dimension of the relative moduli stack uh, over B, with the class beta beta deforms, um, so every component is a dimension greater or equal to the dimension of B plus 2n minus 2, and in particular, because the fibers have dimension um, at least 2n minus 2, then we know that uh, they dominate B. So this dominates B. And um, what else did I want to say about this? Um, Oh, and, and so in, I mean, it's a, of course, it, it's the same computation, but let me maybe just be more precisely, more precise. 
um, if um, if sort of M is uh, the irreducible component, um, of uh, of this thing of the of the of the moduli stack of stable um, maps, uh, and I suppose that this is a reducible component of dimension two n minus two. And uh, maybe I let uh, M be inside this M bar uh, over the relative guy be the irreducible component containing M. And um, then Okay, what did I want to do? I, what do I, in my notes, I have it over a curve. I mean, it's, um, okay, because later, um, uh, why did I want it over a curve? Okay, later I, I'm going to use it over a curve. What time is it? Um, okay, I don't care. But, um, what did I do? Yeah. Okay, maybe let me just do it over a curve and I'm just choosing a curve in B. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but I just, uh, and so um, um, the irreducible contain, uh, uh, the irreducible component containing M and then what you, um, so this is the dimension to N minus two. And so basically what you see is that because this has dimension to N minus one, then uh, this, of course, uh, sort of decks onto this curve, and in particular, it's flat, um, so it's uh, equidimensional. So all fibers have the same dimension. All fibers have the same dimension, and in particular, if you look at the evaluation map into into the into the into the deformation of of C then uh, you're just deforming the locus span by, by the deformations of C. So if the, you deform the, 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 the locus. Sorry, this is not right, but you deform over T the subvarieties, the locus, spanned by, swept by, ufa. Uh, by the curve C and its deformations. Okay, so this is just the only thing that I wanted to say. Okay, so um, now I wanna say, um, I want to prove two and four in the last uh, 14 minutes. Uh, so remember, two was the fact that if the curve is indecomposable, then uh, the space of deformations was exactly two n minus two. And four was the statement about the structure of the locus z spanned by, by c. OK, and so let um, we have the following picture, so m this component uh, containing F. And uh, this is a universal uh, curve with the evaluation map. And let me uh, do what. Julia, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Uh, above you assume that this component already has dimension two and minus two, or is it at least two and minus two? So here, here I say if uh, the fiber, because this has dimension two and minus one, if the fiber has dimension to n minus two, then it the the map surjects. Mm -hmm. This is what I maybe failed to um, to show. Mm -hmm. This is uh, this is the point that uh, if the fiber is not too big, uh, then um, it, it yeah because that is dimension to n minus one, 
then it has to it has to deform sideways okay and now but now we're proving so now we're proving this two plus four right in yeah. two plus four we have to prove that uh, something has dimensioned exactly two and minus two yes we want to show that if so two is this if c mm -hmm. is in decomposable then uh, the dimension at f of uh, the space of, of maps uh, is actually 2n minus 2. Right. But then, uh, but then uh, so we're not assuming at this point that m has this dimension, right? So it's not, no. it's, just, it's just some component, whatever. We know, we can uh, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. We know that uh, it's dimension greater or equal right. to that, and we want to show that it's equal. Right, right, right. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so in particular, if it's, if it's in the composable, then it deforms in codimension one because of um, three, which is this part here. Okay, so um, we have this uh, component containing our um, F and it has dimension greater or equal to, to n minus 2. We want to show that it's equal to, to n minus 2. And we look at the evaluation map and uh, we call it z and we let uh, k be the codimension. So uh, this guy has dimension 2n minus k. So let uh, k be codimension of z. And uh, this has dimension greater or equal to 2n minus 2. And so this is dimension greater or equal to 2n minus 1. And we, we want to show equality there. And so this shows that the fibers of the evaluation map, the general fiber, have dimension greater or equal to uh, k minus 1. OK? So, uh, and here, uh, so mx um, is uh, the locus uh, of deformations of, um, of, of morphism that uh, pass through x. And so this has dimension uh, greater or equal to k minus one. So meaning there's a, a, at least a family uh, of dimension k minus one of uh, rational curves through uh, a general point x. Okay, and uh, so we also denote by uh, z of x um, the locus swept out by the, by the curves through x. Okay. So meaning that uh, if I restrict uh, the curve to the locus of, uh, of rational code through X, and this is the image of the restriction of the evaluation map. Okay, and uh, you can show a little lemma if you want that uh, the X is isotropic. Uh, okay, if you want, you can, uh, uh, if you want to kill it, you can use uh, the Mumford theorem on, on Chabup's, but it, it can just also just pass to a resolution of ZX. And the fact that it's swept by rational curves tell you that uh, the symplectic form has to vanish on the smooth locus. Um, okay, and um, so now um, let me, um, I mean, this is not necessarily the, uh, okay, so now let me recall what the MRC vibration is, uh, uh, maximal rational connected what the, sorry, uh, rational connected vibration. So this is uh, sort of a general fact. So if, uh, I don't know, maybe Y uh, compact Keller manifold, uh, which is covered by rational curves. Uh, 
you can sort of take the quotient of y by the relation of two points or equivalent if they're connected by a rational curve. It's not quite like that, but there is a rational map to some base b and uh, through the fiber through a general point. Um, is, uh, is a set of all points in Y that are connected is all Y and Y connected to X by a chain of rational curves. Okay, and, um, and so now we wanna apply this uh, to this Z, the, the locus Z. And so let uh, Z to B be this uh, M or C vibration. And because again, the fibers are, um, um, are, um, are, are spanned by rational, by, or you have all these rational curves in the fibers, you see that the dimension of B is greater or equal to 2n minus 2k. And because, uh, of course, uh, all the points in zx are all connected by rational curves through x, x is a general point, uh, we see that the dimension of z of x, because z of x will have to be generically in, in those fibers, will be less or equal to k. Okay. So, um, so now we look at, uh, at this, uh, this diagram here. And uh, we know that uh, this has dimension because of what we just said, this is dimension greater or equal to k. This, because of what we were saying here, has dimension greater or equal to k minus one. And, and this has dimension greater than, of course, this is just, you just add one, greater or equal to k, okay? And now we look at that green diagram. So uh, here, let's, uh, let's go here. And uh, we say, so for uh, P and ZX, a general point in particular, different than X, If the fiber of the map, the evaluation map from this to this is positive dimensional, then uh, there exists a positive dimensional family of rational curves through both X and P. Right, that's what the fiber is. And, uh, and then you can use a bend and break argument to show that uh, C breaks. If you have positive dimensional family of rational curves through two general points, then you can show that uh, at some point the curve breaks. Okay, so what this means that if the curve cannot break, then it means that uh, this evaluation map has uh, uh, fibers, zero dimensional fibers generically, of course not over S, but, and so then uh, this, what the conclusion is that all of those guys have dimension. So, so the conclusion is that dimension of Zx equal to the dimension of Cmx is equal to k, and the dimension of Mx is equal to k minus one. And, um, and so looking at how we, we had found this, uh, the, this, um, the thing here, we should, if, if that is equal to, uh, if those are all equalities, it means that also the dimension of x, of m, is equal to 2n minus 2. 
Okay, so maybe I'll. Uh... And um... and in particular, also. Uh... And the fibers of the MRC vibration. All right, uh, K dimensional. Okay, so this is kind of a of a sketch, and um, and again, um, you show that any any holomorphic form on Z has to be able to pull back of something from from downstairs. Okay, and um, I guess I'll just stop here. I was going to um, prove that um, that um, prime exceptional devices deform in co-dimension one, but um, I guess I can do it next time. Super, thank you. Questions? Is there a, an easy example of the MRC fibration that I can just have a picture of, like, um, like what B would be? Uh, well, an easy, the easiest example is uh, the exceptional divisor and its image in the contraction, right? If you have a contraction, right, that makes sense. Then that's, uh, and uh, and in fact, all of uh, the um, exceptional loci of all the stratified Mukai flops uh, that you can think of, that's also the same thing. So these are especially nice because the vibration is also regular morphism and it's not um, rational. Uh, another example is uh, you look at Lagrangian vibration. Um, uh, over an arbitrary base and say um, here I have discriminant locus where uh, the fibers are singular and uh, suppose that um, suppose that the, the general fiber here is a rank one uh, degeneration of an abelian surface um, abelian variety rank one degeneration of an abelian variety. For example, the Jacobian of a nodal curve, a curve with one node. Okay, the compacted by Jacobian. So basically what these fibers are gonna be is uh, you take a, um, an ab so this is say dimension to N, you look at dimension, um, you have a abelian a variety of dimension one less, you take a P1 bundle over it, and then you glue the zero and infinity sections, maybe with a twist. So basically you get this thing here. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and so here, maybe if you pass through the normalization of this, you're separating. Uh, so this is fiber wise. The, the screen thing is what the general fiber of this map M delta to delta is. And if you look at the normalization, you're separating these two points, you're getting back to this P1 bundle. And so then, you know, generically, you have this P1 bundle over a fiber, a family of ABN varieties of dimension one less. So that's, I guess, another concrete example. And again, on the, on the generically, on this family of ABN varieties of dimension N minus one, you will have a holomorphic symplectic form. Um, uh, so you have a homomorphic two form, which is generically symplectic. So I guess these are some sort of easy examples that come from um, um, from hyperkeller geometry. Another good example is um, I don't know how familiar you are with the. Uh, Lundland Sorgen van Straten example, um, but uh, basically, uh, 
say y is a cubic fourfold and h is um, the main component of the Hilbert scheme of twisted cubics in y. And uh, it turns out that when you look at the MRC vibration of this, it's regular and the base is a hyperkeller eightfold. Uh, so this is dimension 10. And, um, and this uh, hyperkeller eightfold is a uh, deformation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of four points on the K3. It's a Lenlen Sorge Menstraten eightfold. And uh, there's a sort of nice geometric way to, to view the two dimensional families, which if you can, if you want, I can tell you about. But in general, when you have a, a sort of the philosophy is when you look at a moduli space of uh, objects in the derived category of a cubic fourfold, if you project onto the Kuznets of component, then you look at the induced map between moduli spaces, then you get some MRC quotient. That's, that's not really a statement, but more a general principle, I would say. Great, thank you, that was awesome. I had a very kind of basic question. When you talked about this prime divisors, yeah, uh, there were two cases. One is, uh, one is that the fibers are P1 and the other fibers are union of two P1s, right? Yes. And am I supposed to understand that the the locally in the second picture tile locally I get like the resolution of a a two singularity. Yeah, exactly. But globally, but globally those two things are uh, there's some it, kind it, of global monodromy. Yes. That yes. Yes. Uh, however, I think that uh, in compact hypercalamanticals we don't know if that case exists, so it's a little embarrassing. But uh, in K3N, uh, it's been excluded. So only the first type of contraction happens. And we don't know if, um, um, if that case was a monodromy of the two components, if that actually happened. Okay, thanks. Yeah. More questions? So in general, locally, right? I mean, I think you know that better than me, but you have a you know, in could have mentioned one, in could have mentioned two on the base, you have just a, a chain of rational curves with a Dinkton diagram, and you have a group acting on the uh, on the diagram on the on the graph, and so the based on the orbits of the group action, you have uh, the irreducible components globally, right, over the, the base. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, more questions for Julia? So this is sort of about the same thing. So that, that A2 is like a slow slice in um, a uh, nilpotent orbit. So it's like two P1s connected to each other. Is there like a quick way to explain why you don't get like A3 or something? Um, yeah, actually, I now I don't remember how. Uh, yeah, I should have looked at before lecturing. I think, uh, uh, I think it, I, I, I would look into it. I, I forget actually now. Uh, what the what the reason is? And it, it has to be a prime divisor, right? It has to be that their automorphism of this Dinkin diagram have to act transitively. And yes, I don't, and, uh, yeah, oh. I don't think there's. I don't think there are any other examples. Oh, just because of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good point. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's uh, all thank you, uh, Julia, uh, for this wonderful presentation. We'll meet again uh, in a week time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.